cut. Hey everybody, welcome back to the shop. So today we're going to do part two of my square video. The first video we talked about the combination square quite a bit. Today, as you can see, I got a bunch of squares piled up here on the uh, bench, but I want to finish the combination squares up first. If you remember in the last video at the end, I said I was going to throw uh, one of my older uh, combination squares into the evaporous bath, and it is here. Now, truth be told, I have a few other things in this bath, so I'm going to take them out as well. An old rusty hammer that looks like it came out perfectly. <laughs> And let's take a look at what we got. There is no maker's mark on this particular square. Um, some people, you know, collectors, would be upset that I did something like this to this square. And I understand what they're saying. So, some of them would say that patina was, you know, it took years to make that patina. And it was, you know, it made it a very good looking collectible square. The fact that there's no maker's mark on this square tends to lead me to believe that this is not a collectible tool at all. Um, looking at it here, I mean, there's no maker's mark on this as well. It does have kind of a, kind of a nice ornate casting to it, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, so it's a nice looking square. And it is... Coming back to a nice, uh, nice clean look. The way this goes back together is the hook goes in like this. Now, this particular square, I will tell you, is missing a, uh, a piece. There should be a spring that goes in here before I put the nut on. And it's just not here. Um, nothing I can do about it. It's missing. Um, so there it is. There's our square. There it is there. It is uh, obviously a, a, a readable square now. Now, you could take this to a wire brush. You could make this shiny metal again. I might clean it up a little bit more, but the intentions for me was to use this tool, not to make it, you know, a beauty queen. This tool, so you know, I can date this to be between 50 and probably 75 years old. This was my grandfather's. That's why I know. He passed away 41 years ago. I remember as a kid using this with him. Um, I'm going to guess he bought this at a local hardware store which back then sold things without names on them. Uh, many times, you know, one manufacturer would make these things. They might put a, a maker's mark on them for certain stores. They might uh, not leave it blank and they just sell them in hardware stores. They also, uh, the other place he might have gotten it would be Sears, but Sears would have had uh, a maker's mark on it. Um, I'm gonna take it back apart. One other thing you can do I wanna talk about are these three rubberized, uh, I don't know what you call them. They're just rubberized uh, pads with grit in them. They're they're like sanding sponges, but they're much harder than the sanding sponge you get at the, the, the home center to do uh, sheetrock with. And these do remove a little bit of rust. And this might clean this, uh, this uh, gunmetal color we have here. It might clean it up a little bit. So let's give that a try. Oh yeah, look at that. Okay, again, not wire wheel shiny, but very readable now. This is very readable. I'm very happy with, very happy with how this looks now. This is definitely a usable tool. I want to. I'm not going to put it back on. I want to dry this off some more. But I, that you can see how these things can be cleaned up. I will put a link to these down below and actually get the name of them because I don't really remember what they were called. But with a snap of my fingers, I'm going to uh, change this table out and we're going to have all the new squares and we're going to talk about the new squares. That'll come right now. All right, everybody, now that we got the uh, evaporust experiment out of the way, let's talk about the rest of the squares I have on this table. I have several, and I'm going to be honest, most of these squares can do one 
or a few of the things that the combination square already can do. That's why I say the combination square is really the jack of all trades square and the first one you should get your hands on. But unless you're that minimalist guy that only wants one square, uh, there are others to obtain and they have uses. So let's talk about them. And the first one I want to talk about is the tri-square. It is the other square in the whole square family here that I truly believe is a woodworking square. Uh, and what is a tri-square? Well, we already talked about this one here. This is the $4 square I purchased. We're going to fix this at the end of this video. Uh, it's a tri-square. Basically, it, it's a one-trick pony. It does 90 degrees. It also will obviously check a board for 90 degrees. Um, the beauty of this square to the combination square is it doesn't have moving parts. So the thought is if you get it to be square, it'll stay square. You don't have to worry about moving it and making it go out of square. There's no moving parts, no friction. Um, and they're very simple to operate. They do one thing and they do it very well. Uh, I have several here. We know about this one. We're going to fix this one. This is a very, well, when I say very old, this is about 20 years old. I bought this at Home Depot right when I started doing woodworking a little over 20 years ago. It's made by the, the Johnson Level and Rule Company, who make layout tools still to this day. They were probably the empire uh, of the day 20-something years ago at Home Depot. They were the company making the layout tools. This was an inexpensive square. It was, as of yesterday, very out of square. I fixed this one yesterday, practicing so that when I do this one, I know how to do it and I don't make any mistakes on camera. You know, I do that sometimes. I, uh, I will record a little, I will fix something off camera before I actually do it on camera. Uh, so this, this is a perfectly good working square now. There's several others here. What I do want to talk about is these here. These fall into the engineering square uh, realm. Uh, they're, they're still technically tri-squares, but they're milled out of basically uh, a block of aluminum, this one looks like. They're made to a better tolerance. They're, they're made, you know, they're, they're just a little more accurate. And I'm talking in the thousands. Um, when you buy them. These are just more accurate. I love this little guy here. This is the one that I use normally when I'm checking, when I'm joining a board to check for square. Just run it down the board like that to check for square. Um, this is obviously a woodpecker's tri-square. It is a uh, it is expensive. Um, no way around it. A, a woodpecker's tool is expensive but it is uh, uh, worth every penny in my mind. It is a, a well-made tool. It's very accurate. This is easily my most accurate square. Uh, so it's my boilerplate square. It is the one that tells me what is and isn't square. Um, the one square that bucks the, uh, the uh, trend of being non-movable is this one here. Um, I got this on a Craigslist ad that I answered. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I, it says M Power. I don't know who made it. These were advertised quite a bit about 10 years ago. I saw them in all the stores. The difference with this one is this blade actually is adjustable with these two. Uh, you know, they're, they're Allen keys here. They're little star keys. So I can adjust this to bring it back to square by loosening screws instead of having to file something away. So I'm going to be honest. It's a well-made square and it's very nice and when it's square it's nice to use. It has these big wings so it definitely butts up to a board of quite nicely. But it can go out of square because it's got movable parts. And generally it's one that I'm like, oh man, I gotta check it. I might have to adjust it. I don't want to mess with it. I grab another one. Um, it is what it is. So the tri-square to me is the other really true woodworking uh, square in the system. Now let's move on to some of these other things I have on the bench here. Alright guys, the next squares I want to talk about are more 
Uh, let's call them the carpentry slash construction level of, of squares. I have several of them here. Uh, we all know what this is. This is a framing square. And this is not a true full length. This is 16 by 12. The true ones are uh, uh, 24 by uh, maybe 16 or 18. I'd have to go downstairs and get my full length one. I will do that before this video is over. Um, honestly, these squares are... I, I'm going to be honest, this square hangs in my basement next to my lumber pile uh, and I just use it at the very beginning of a project when I'm bucking lumber down from full size to smaller. I don't use this square at all when I'm doing, uh, you know, joinery or anything like that. This is a very rudimentary square for fine woodworking, but it is good to make a square line, to make a cut on a board, to break it down to a smaller size, to bring it to your tools, to mill it, to then do your joinery where you use more exacting squares to finish your work. Um, but, you know, if you have one of these, you can use it to make a square line. The other construction type squares we have here, I think you know, I've used some of these before. These are the rafter squares. Um, this is, again, our friend Empire. Uh, this is a large one, a 12-inch rafter square. Um, this can do the same thing that this does. Put it by your lumber pile. Use it to make uh, lines on rough cut lumber to break them down to size. You can also use something like this with your skill saw. Put the saw on your board, bring, bring it up, and use it to cut a board off, running it, using this as the fence. So as we know, these uh, rafter squares or speed squares come in aluminum, plastic. They are, uh, at this size, they're very handy. Uh, you could use these for woodworking. You could, you could use these for 90 and 45 degrees. But again, we already know our combination square does 90 and 45 degrees. But as you can see, you have a 90 degree and a 45 degree here. This is the little trim square. It has a bonus that the speed squares don't have. This base is offset. This is, this is a quarter inch, this is three eighths of an inch. Those are interesting dimensions for uh, three quarter inch lumber. You can find the center of our board with the three inch side. You can uh, make a mortise quarter inch, uh, quarter inch, quarter inch, center mortise quarter inch uh, with, with the quarter inch side of this thing. So uh, I've done a full video on this trim square because I love it so much. Milwaukee makes these. If you could find the two of these still at Home Depot in a kit for $15, grab it. It's a great deal. They were offered at the holiday season. Some of them may be laying around in the store still. Grab one if you can find it because these things are uh, about 12 bucks a piece otherwise. So uh, that was a great deal at the holiday times. Uh, the speed squares have their uses. I'm going to be honest with you. At this point, I'm going to say if you were going to have a couple of squares in your kit. Obviously, we start with the combination square. We talked about that in the last video. I would then add a tri-square in a mid-range size. This is eight inches, probably a good size to get. Get the best one you can afford. You don't have to buy the uh, woodpeckers if it's not in the budget. It's a great square, but you don't have to go that route. And they do make them in multiple sizes. Um, you could get something like this. Like I said, this was out of square and I squared it. I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute. You can also add, I would add this trim square. I think he's great for woodworking. The little offset base it is a wonderful trick that has some uses and it's good to just use. These two and a combination square can get you through 99% of your woodworking with lumber. If you're using sheet goods, that's another story because none of these are very long. So sheet goods are going to require a little bit different square. We're going to talk about that in a minute. One other construction type or carpentry type tool is this bevel square here. And this is uh, an older one. And what this does is this, this is a tool that you can put up against a board and get the angle and lock it down. And then transfer the angle. So if you have, uh, you know, in construction, this is used a lot, molding, trim work, things like that. You got a rotten board on the side of a house. You need to cut it off. You got to find the angle before you, you uh, cut it off. This works well. 
In woodworking, this is something that you could use if your woodworking involves restoring old furniture. You got an old board, you got to replace a piece on it, and it has an angle to it. Take it up to that board, get the angle, there's your angle, take it to a new board, and lay it out. And then you have uh, the new angle, and you can re recreate that piece of uh, lumber that's in the, uh, the old furniture. Alright, so those are the construction slash carpentry tools that I own. These tools are woodworking slash carpentry tools. I use the term kind of interchangeably. Um, honestly, I, I don't want to get into the fine woodworking to carpentry argument. I think they're all a form of woodworking. The difference really is just the tolerances that you work to. You know, if you're framing a wall in your basement, you can be a 64th inch off with that 2x4 and nobody's going to care. Uh, but if you're building a dovetail drawer and you're a 64th or a 32nd off, it might leave a little crack that you could see. Now, a 64th, you could fill that pretty easily. Uh, but, you know, if you're a 16th or an 8th off, that might be too much for a dovetail. You know, you could take a hammer and move a 2x4 an eighth of an inch with one whack and you're back in business, you're close enough. Uh, that's what I mean by the differences between carpentry and fine woodworking. It's just the tolerances that you work to. And the tools, obviously, are made and machined to different tolerances, as we can see. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven other squares on this table that are different types of uses. Let's talk about this T-square first. This is obviously a 24 in, actually is this? Yeah, 24 inch Woodpecker's T-square. Uh, I purchased this as a gift to myself. Uh, every January I buy myself kind of a specialty tool, the beginning of the year, kind of a gift to myself. I've been doing that for a few years now. These two, wood, these two Woodpecker tools were purchased in January uh, on that realm. I've bought a few other things like that. It's just kind of a, you know, a tool I wouldn't have purchased for myself throughout the year normally. I do it once a year in January. I go to the woodworking show up in Baltimore and pick something up. Obviously, this year being the year it is, I got no gift this year. Uh, I might still reward myself with something I don't know. Uh, but there was no woodworking show, obviously, so I didn't go up there. This is, the reason I got this is this is good for sheet goods. This is good for, for making uh, larger panels, so to speak. It obviously is going to give me a line on a piece of plywood. I am planning to build a lot of cabinets in the basement in the next coming months and this purchase was made actually a year ago with that in mind and I'm just getting around to it now. But that's why I got this. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be brutally honest. You don't need to spend the hundred dollars that that costs. You can get these actually made out of uh, wood or plastic at uh, hobby stores. You know Michaels or something sell these for you know under 20 bucks made out of uh, aluminum or plastic, just much cheaper. And it works fine for sheet goods. You could also get the big uh, uh, four foot long one that they sell at the home centers uh, that actually folds up. I don't know how accurate it is. I think they're more used for sheetrock than plywood. Uh, but you could use something like that. Personally, when I cut sheet goods down for the most part from an eight foot section, it's done by making marks and using a straight edge to draw the line and then rough cutting them and then bring them to normal sizes down in the basement with a tool like this and the table saw. So I don't need anything bigger than this because I'm not using this on the full eight foot sheet. Um, so that's that. I'm gonna talk about a few, what I'm gonna call Japanese tools here and I don't like using the term Japanese. Maybe I should use Asian or Eastern. Um, I don't know because, let's be honest. I don't know if all these tools originated in Japan or Korea or some other country. And there are different Asian saws and Asian uh, uh, planes uh, and squares. But these three tools actually come from Lee Valley and Lee Valley's catalog labels them Japanese. So I'm going to use the term Japanese. And let's look at them right now. Okay, so here's the three Japanese style squares, and they actually in the catalog call them Japanese style layout squares. This one is obviously very similar to a speed square or your combination square. It does, excuse me, it does 90, it does 45. It actually has the little indentations here, kind of like your speed square has, where you could make some lines uh, 
on the board, uh, you know, parallel uh, to, a, to an edge. This is, in my mind, uh, honestly, guys, this is this is very similar to a to a speed square, just milled more accurately. This is a nicely milled piece of aluminum, and I did check this for 90 degrees, and it is actually very square. Uh, Lee Valley sells this thing for $23.50, so it's definitely more expensive than a speed square. Uh, this one here is just, they call it a, um, just a Japanese double miter square, and it's pretty obviously, its name is correct. It's dual 45s, so you basically can just mark 45 degrees, it's just what it does. Obviously it also can check a machine layout for 45 degrees, say your table saw blade. Uh, this one is going to run you sixteen dollars and ninety cents, so seventeen bucks. Again, it's well milled. It's 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 a more accurate tool than say the speed square. This guy here is an interesting tool. It is, uh, you know, they call it just Japanese square, and it costs thirty four dollars. When I saw it, I bought it almost sight unseen because I thought it was really neat. Um, it just takes a little work to get used to. The way it works, you know, a regular square like, you know, this little piece of framing square here that's just even smaller, you know, when you put it down to the board, you got to kind of lean this down a little bit. So you're always leaning it a little bit. You're not quite flat or not quite flush. This thing resolves that by, you know, you put this here and you can just bend this a little bit. It's flexible. So you're still flush to the table, but you can still reference the board square. Uh, so, I'm going to be honest, guys. I'm really going to go out on a limb here. I purchased this because I thought it was neat as hell. I never use it. I have not mastered doing this. I'm just not good at it, and it's easier for me to grab something like this to make that mark. So, you know, it's the same length at the end. It looks like it's a quarter of an inch difference. Uh, I, I just... Uh, you know, I thought it was cool. I spent $35 on this. I've honestly never used it. Um, your mileage may vary. Uh, I'm a klutz. You know, I'm a bull in a china shop. I have a hard time using it. You may pick it up the first time and say, this is the greatest thing in the world. So I don't want to detract from it. But that's just how it is. So these two are usable for the angles. Um, but that's the, uh, quote, Japanese style squares. All right, guys, I want to talk about this Anchor Square. I, this is another tool I purchased and don't use that much. The reason I don't use it is this comes with a very fine mechanical pencil. And, you know, you take the pencil, you put it in the hole, and you move, and it makes the lines. Unfortunately, you know, we're talking more about John the Klutz here, John the Bull in the China Shop. Every time I use this, I snap the lead. Um, that's me. I'm a klutz, okay? So this is a very well milled, very accurate tool, and it goes down to 60 fourths of an inch. So if you need to make a, a mark out here, 10 and uh, 15 60 fourths, you could find that hole and make that line. So it's an accurate tool, but it's again a tool that I don't use well because I'm not comfortable with it. Um, so let's move on. Um, this is these three tools here are the last squares I'm going to talk about. All three of these are used to find angles beyond uh, these other squares that do 90 and 45 degrees. Kind of a, a theme here, isn't it? You know, this would be the protractor on the combination square. So again, this is a one-trick pony. This does what the protractor does. It gets you any angle in that 180-degree sweep. Same with this thing. Now, guys, let's be honest. Look at this. This is this is uh, this is plastic. I'm not even. That's that, that goes in the garbage. That's where that belongs. Don't buy plastic layout tools unless it's one of these. Unless it's one of these that you're going to use to guide your skill saw with. That kind of stuff. You know, I don't know where I got that. I'm sure it came from Harbor Freight. Don't buy plastic layout tools. They're not accurate enough. In fine woodworking, you want to work to a tolerance much better than a plastic tool. I brought that out just to do that joke where I flip it in the garbage can. I've never used that. I use this occasionally. If I really need to get an accurate mark that's not 45 or 90 degrees, I go to the combination square and I use the protractor because I know that's accurate. So, I'm going to clean this desk off. We're going to get this right here 
and a file, and we're going to make him square. That's coming up next. All right, guys, it's time to fix this square, or should I say square this square. Now, I'm going to pan down and focus in on the uh, vise down here and the board, uh, and things are going to look a little bit different here in a minute. Funny story for you here. Everything you've seen in this video up to this point with me in the green shirt really was uh, filmed back in January. It's now August. I kind of forgot to finish the video and do this part here, which was square up this square. So I apologize for that, uh, you know, because I had mentioned in the combination square video that there'd be a second part with these other squares. I don't know what happened, but I, uh, I kind of got lost and screwed it up. But we're going to finish it. I'm going to square this square up, make it very usable, and we'll be good to go with this video. So I'm going to move the camera down here to the vise that, so you can see what I'm doing. All right, guys. So we have the square here. Let's do a little test to see how square it is. Remember how we did this. Okay, and hopefully you can see that there. This thing is a big V. It is going from a point here out to an eighth of an inch out like this, which to me means this thing is, we're doing the, we were doing the outside of the blade. So that means it's like this. So it's closed down a little bit, meaning this shaft is over this way a little bit. So to fix that, we want to take some metal off of this side here uh, to bring it back in alignment. What that'll do is make it come back out like this a little bit. So we're going to put it in the vise. You notice we have a different bench here now. Everything's changed since January. Here. And I'm going to work starting on this side and work my way this way. I'm going to make small strokes. Give it another test. As you can see, it's closed down some, but it's sure not square yet, so let's keep going. Number seven almost looks like I'm at a point here and a little open here, so I went a little too far. Can you see that point to slightly open? So let's fix that. To fix that now, we want to just remove a little bit at the toe. All right, guys, I'm calling number eight a winner. That looks pretty good. We got it done. As you can see, when we started here, let's see how close I can get. When we started, we had a very big gap at the end. We have a solid line. 
Hey everybody, so that is how you uh, square a square up. As you can see, he is back up here where he belongs. Uh, what I can tell you is I took these sanding sponges, I took the medium and the fine to this after uh, I squared the inside, and the blade cleaned up nice. I got the, uh, I got the uh, price tag off of it. I hit the brass a little bit. I even hit the wood a little bit. It definitely looks much nicer now. It's a, it's a very nice tool. It's nice and solid, and it's square. I squared this side. The inside was very difficult to square. There was This thing was pretty far off. I think it dropped somewhere. I don't know what happened to it. So it looks good. It's clean. It'll have a place up on the wall. I'll be using it. Uh, I think this was a, a fun little project. I'm sorry it took so long to get the final piece of this video out. It's six months late. Albeit being a little late, it's here now and it's out. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please hit the like button. And as always, if you haven't subscribed, please go ahead and subscribe and have a great day. We'll see you in the next one.